Hello, we'll be beginning in just a moment. Welcome everybody. We'll be beginning the conference in about 30 seconds. I want to thank all of you for joining us today. All right, good afternoon. Uh, I uh, want to give you today's update um, on uh, COVID in Colorado, uh, also the, the fires briefly. Uh, we will be uh, back for uh, in-person press conference Friday at the governor's mansion, but we, as you know, we do some virtually, we do some in person. Uh, the ones we do in person, uh, for those who um, in the media, they know this, but for those who uh, haven't attended, members of the public, we do them all uh, in a safer way as possible. Uh, all the people in the room, the members of the media, our production crew are masked. Uh, we also have uh, the chairs uh, six feet apart uh, for all those attending. Uh, and uh, we, we do our best to keep everybody safe. We also include some of the virtual sessions uh, like this for people from across the state to be able to ask questions. Uh, we are at 74,191 cases today. Uh, we continue to worry about the trend in Colorado. Uh, we have um, a plateau and Dr. Rachel Hurley, he will be here to talk about it. In some areas of the state, the cases continue to go up. Really what we watch and what's important you might recall from the very start, uh, we talked about our North Star not overwhelming our hospital capacity. And what's what's alarming to me is we, we, we have 246 people hospitalized. Now that number isn't alarming, it's well within our capacity. What's alarming is that it's increased substantially from about 170 to about 246 over a two week period. So if that were to continue, Again, for another two weeks, another two weeks, uh, we would be back in a situation where uh, the best quality of care, and we all see how important the quality of care is. We saw that with the president. We see that with anybody who's experienced COVID. Not everybody will get better, <clears throat> but most will. But we wanna make sure that that quality of care at a hospital is available for all those who need it, because in most cases, it will save their life. In, in some cases, it'll end, uh, of course, tragically, and we won't. On that note, uh, my condolences to the uh, just over 2,000 people in Colorado and their families uh, who have paid the ultimate price from COVID. There's many more who are still in lengthy and difficult recoveries, uh, and we wish them well. With regard to the fires, uh, Cameron Peak Fire, 127,398 acres, is now 42% contained. Uh, it is the third largest fire in our state history. Uh, 99 structures destroyed, um, and the state is a recovery task force working with the county on the recovery options. I was in Larimer County last week getting briefed on the fire uh, and the mitigation uh, efforts. The Mullen Fire, uh, which of course has come down from Wyoming, now 151,711 acres, uh, now in, in Jackson County and, 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 uh, and, and spread into Colorado. The, the bulk of that fire is in Wyoming, 14% contained at this point. Uh, we are seeing the negative air quality primarily from those two fires. And a brief note on that, uh, I even heard from a friend, a friend who said uh, they've had uh, fire-related breathing trouble for the last couple of months, as, as many people have. During that time, just to be sure, they got tested twice for COVID, it was negative. And they got tested again, uh, and, it, it, and it turns out that they're, they have COVID. And so just to point out again, the symptoms, the difficulty breathing, um, coughs, these are often associated with the poor air quality. But if you have them, even if you think it's the poor air quality, please get tested because it could also be the early symptoms of COVID, right? That's how it first manifests itself. Uh, before it could worsen and requiring hospitalization several days in. So there's free testing sites. We'll talk more about that later. It's easy to get tested, plenty of testing in Colorado. Uh, and if you are experiencing respiratory symptoms that you think might be because of the fires, please, there's a good chance it is because of the fires, first of all, but please uh, be sure, get tested, be safe. Uh, we're learning things about COVID uh, every day, but what we know for sure is that we cannot get complacent during this period. Uh, the recent news from Washington, from the White House, is just another reminder that none of us, even the President of the United States, 
is immune from this deadly virus. So we have to remain vigilant. Uh, we need to continue doing what we know works to reduce the transmission, wearing a mask when around others, keeping uh, social distance from others, being outdoors where we can, avoiding large groups, washing hands frequently. And when we do together, do, when we do these things together, it will reduce your risk of getting the virus, your risk of spreading the virus. You know, it's been it's been challenging to watch um, uh, the way that the, the White House has been handling this on a on a personal level. You know, um, the president, uh, when he wants things to happen, he doesn't really understand how to how to do it in the right way. Uh, example, the president wanted we all want kids to be back in school. But rather than have a plan to do it safely, uh, the president tries to bully people to go back to school. You have to return. You have to return um, without actually helping the states or the school districts to return with the PPE we need, with the testing that we need. Uh, it had the federal government acted early, there could have been an investment in better ventilation systems. It, it's it's the same thing with the virus. So you know, like a lot of things, um, the, the the president is taking this in a wrong and divisive direction with regard to his counsel and what he's advising people to do. When he says, don't be afraid, you've heard me say very similar things. I say, it's not a time for fear. It's a time for caution, for being careful, for being smart. Um, and that's the other side of that. Of course, it's not a time for fear, but it doesn't mean you throw your mask off, have large groups and get people sick and die. It means it's not a time for fear. It's a time for caution, meaning be careful, go about your lives. You don't need to cower in your in your in your uh, corner, but be safe, be smart, keep your distance from others. Uh, it's what we try to model as governor. I'm out. I'm talking to people. We're always trying to do it in a safe way outside where possible. Uh, like every other Colorado, there's a chance I could contract the virus, but we do everything we can to keep uh, the members of our team safe, just as we would advise uh, any member of the public to stay safe. Um, really with mask wearing, social distancing. So it's not a time for fear, it's a time for caution. So I think the danger in the president's message is that it can easily be interpreted as it's not a time for fear, it's a time for recklessness. That's in many ways what he models with his personal behavior. Uh, it is true that it is not a time for fear. It is true that kids should be able to return to school safely. So let's do the work to make sure it happens for our schools. We've been providing as a state KN95 masks to every teacher every week in our schools, and we're gonna be able to continue that. Uh, and of course, uh, for those who can stay at home and be safe, and, and my, my parents who are at great risk from this virus at age 76 are uh, staying at home. In fact, my mom was very worried that she needed an emergency dental procedure. She went out, she had it done, she needed to. Uh, but she won't see the extended family of the grandkids. And, well, that's a tough decision for all of us. Uh, I, I do support her in that because we want her to be here for decades to come. And uh, while they're relatively healthy 76-year-olds, uh, they're at great risk. At that, at that age range, about a quarter to a half of the people that get coronavirus are hospitalized. And while many make it out, some don't. And for those who are, it's, it can be a lengthy hospitalization and it can be very difficult and it can cause other health problems. So uh, I, it's char it's hard and, and some people are uh, staying at home and, and staying safe where they can, but for the rest of us who have to work, who have to go out, uh, we shouldn't be fearful, we should be careful. And that's what I hope Coloradans do. Uh, we're productive, we're industrious, we're innovative, and we're thoughtful and careful about how we do it. And that's how we will successfully contain the virus in Colorado. It's really up to your behavior, to your choices. Uh, I know that you with the right information will make good, good choices. I'll just give another example. Um, lots of parents listening to this might've had or have kids' birthdays coming up. Our son turned nine the other day. Um, and yes, you can make a, a good safe decision not to have a celebration or to have a small family celebration. And uh, I respect that, and I, I think that's a reasonable decision to make. But if you do want to have a party, and we did have a small one, uh, we had a few kids from his class over, so not the normal social uh, interactions of having to invite the whole class. We kept it under 10 people outside. Kids wore masks. And so we designed activities around that. I took, uh, I got a couple rolls of wheatback pennies. I hid them all over the yard. 
uh, and and uh, in the neighborhood. And so the kids then, 10 kids, they just went out and they searched for them separately, kept them busy. It was great. Um, you know, one parent even told me they found some wheatbacks in Indian head and maybe he'll start um, coin collecting. So a good way to keep them busy. When we gave them cake, they were seated on the grass, you know, eight feet apart, enjoyed the cake. Uh, we brought out a candle on uh, just on the slice of cake so that you would just blow on the slice and blow it out rather than the whole cake. Look, you can do it. You can be safe and not have a kid's birthday party. You can have a safe one. Uh, what do you not want to do? Have the same kind of birthday party you had two years ago or a year ago. We all took for granted that day will return. But have fun. Make those experiences meaningful. It's the same with Halloween. Do it in a safe way. What are we? What is my family doing for Halloween? We are each going to be in charge of two rooms in our house. So we're each going to have two changes of costume. There's four of us. And the rest of the family will sort of go trick-or-treating, uh, knock on the door, the bedroom, the, uh, the kids' room, the, the closet, the common room. And uh, and whoever decorates that entryway, that person, our son or daughter, will, egg, will enter, answer the door, hand out candy. So we're just going to do it all in our house. Some people want to go out, and that is fine. Again, uh, when we see the normal Halloween behavior, the biggest dangerous large groups going together, especially adolescents. We see that, you know, 15 year olds, 16 year olds, we all did it. Sometimes it's a group of 10 or 12 or 15 or 20 people, you know, go out two or three people, be safe, avoid those face to face interactions. But if you can do it in your home, you can still have fun, make it a, make it a special, make it a memorable Halloween. It's hard to believe that this has actually been seven months since we announced the first confirmed case of COVID in Colorado. Uh, more of this is behind us than ahead of us. I strongly believe that, that we are past the halfway point. We've worked very hard to put the right policies in place. It's really up to people's behavior to maintain this progress in the coming weeks and months. We've surged our testing capacity. That's one of the reasons Colorado has had between a three and 4% positivity rate, relatively low. Part of that is encouraging people to get tested when they have symptoms so that we catch a higher percentage of the people that have the virus and we can quarantine and isolate early. Uh, we've also uh, implemented a world-class uh, contact tracing ability. Uh, individuals are stepping up. They're being responsible. Uh, people have uh, worked at home and, and, and are very effective in doing that. Uh, many people have transitioned to be able to do that at least part of the time to reduce the density of the workplace. And for those who have to go in, and we know there are many in, in manufacturing and food production and many other fields, uh, we're being safer about it. There are still site-based outbreaks in these fields, but uh, the mask wearing, the hand washing, the distancing, it's making a difference. It's saving lives. It's saving our economy. And we need to keep it up. Uh, we're all tired of the virus, but the virus is not tired of us. We're going to get through this uh, and we're going to be to do it without fear, but with care. And that's a very important part uh, of that message. One of the reasons that we are doing reasonably well so far is because we have a Colorado way of doing things. That's an independence that we all cherish, the ability to make our own choices, set our own risks, coupled with the interconnectedness and the responsibility that we know we have to ourselves, our loved ones, uh, and one another. This Colorado way to buck politics, uh, to make sure that mass and social distancing are not at all political, they're science-based, whether you're a super conservative, super liberal, or somewhere in the middle. Uh, you care about your own life. You care about your friends and family. And by making the right choices, you are helping to protect them. That's how we can continue to sustain our progress in Colorado, moving forward with economic growth, with saving lives. It's a key to preserving our way of life in the face of the greatest global pandemic in a century. It's only true though, if we keep it up, the virus is still here and the minute we lapse, uh, Colorado, like other states, could become a hotspot, uh, a great loss of life and great setback to the economy because people and consumer confidence would be shattered. Tourism would stop. People would be scared to go out to, to dinner or lunch. Uh, and it would really be devastating to have that kind of setback. The virus doesn't care. It's here. And uh, we need to continue to act like it's here and learn to live with it without fear, but with caution to get through this until there's a vaccine or a cure. Uh, there are of course promising therapies. Uh, they might reduce hospitalizations by 20 to 30% from people who contract it, but they are not yet widely available and they are not game changers yet. 
Now, here's what concerns us. We've seen a trend in increased hospitalizations. Uh, on, se on September 4th, there were 132 hospitalizations. October 5th, 233. So critical juncture. We cannot continue this trend. We're not currently at all jeopardizing our capacity, but we cannot continue this trend. We've got to do better to avoid overwhelming our hospitals. And that means doubling down on the basics, wearing a mask, social distancing, keeping activities and interactions outside where possible, washing hands regularly. Look, we're saying these things till, till we're blue in the face. You've heard them. You know what you need to do. Uh, we just all need to do a better job doing them. And I know that, that you will, and I know that Colorado will. Uh, to put a finer point on the data that we have, the latest information, the latest trends, uh, I'd like to turn it over to Dr. Rachel Herlihy, our state epidemiologist. Dr. Herlihy. Good afternoon. Thank you, Governor. Could we have the slides, please? Great, thank you. Next slide. So this afternoon, I'd like to share with you an update on cases and hospitalization trends in the state, and then spend a little bit of time talking about projections for the fall and winter, including talking about how disease levels in the next couple of weeks will really set us up for some success or some challenges potentially as we move into the Thanksgiving and winter holiday season. But first, I want to start here with our weekly case trends. Um, so what you can see is that for um, two weeks in September, we saw very substantial increases in our cases across the state, a 63% increase the week of the 13th, um, a 22% week to increase two weeks ago. And then this past week, if we look at all age groups combined, we did see a small decrease, a 14% decrease. So we are continuing to see high levels of disease transmission. But the story is a little bit different when you look at some age specific data. So I wanna go to the next slide. So this shows you these same week over week trends, but specifically for 18 to 25 year olds. And what you see here is that we've made substantial progress in the last week, a 45% decrease in disease transmission among our 18 to 25 year old cases. And, and this obviously reflects the substantial work that is being done on our college campuses and in our counties where we have college campuses to really decrease the level of disease transmission that's occurring in those age groups. However, you look at the next slide, you'll see that the story is different if we look at other age groups. So if we exclude the 18 to 25 year olds and we look at all other age groups, including older Coloradans in the state, you'll see that we're really experiencing this plateau in disease transmission that the governor mentioned. So you can see that we've we've really not budged, we've not decreased at all in the last week. Um, if you look at age groups other than these, these college age students. And so this is a concerning trend for us that you know we haven't seen a decrease from that, what we believe was a Labor Day spike that we experienced. We continue to see a plateau in these age groups. And, and we're now, as the governor mentioned, starting to see this translate into pretty substantial increases in hospitalizations in the state. And we'll talk about that in just a second. Next slide. But I wanted to share this figure with you as well, which shows you both the scope or size of overall estimated um, outbreaks we've had in the state or, or increases in disease transmission or waves of disease that we've had in the state, as well as the comparison of those estimated number of infections to reported cases. So what you'll see in the light orange colored bars here is what we estimate the number of infections that have occurred day over day in the state. So you can see our large spring wave, a smaller summer wave, and now this increase around our third wave of illness that we're seeing. In the darker orange bars, which you'll see are actual reported cases to the state. And so the takeaway here is that if you look at the size of that first wave, that light orange wave compared to the dark orange wave in the spring, you'll see that we are now capturing many more of the cases in the state, meaning that we have substantial testing occurring in the state so that we can really identify the majority of the cases that are happening right now. So if you look at that first wave, it was about 10% of cases that were being tested and reported to public health. And that includes both symptomatic and asymptomatic cases. If you look at the most recent weeks, you'll see that more than half of cases, both symptomatic and asymptomatic cases are now being tested and reported to public health. And this really gives us the opportunity to intervene on those cases, do case investigation and contact tracing work and really intervene and prevent additional disease transmission from occurring. Next slide. 
So as I mentioned, we're also seeing a substantial increase in hospital admissions in the state, and that's shown in this figure here. So the blue vertical bars show you daily new hospital admissions for COVID-19 in the state, and the dark blue line shows you our seven-day average. And you'll see that we've seen a steady increase in hospitalizations, um, if you look at that seven-day average, over the last two weeks or so. And unfortunately, in the last couple of weeks, we've seen some acceleration there. And next slide, please. So this next figure shows you observed hospitalizations compared to projected hospitalizations based on our modeling work. So if you look at the black line and track that over time, that is the number of hospitalizations that have occurred in the state. And that is compared to a green line and a red line here, which are estimated projections of hospitalizations that, that would have occurred based on measured levels of social distancing through our modeling work. And so what you can see here is that on September 21st, when we fit the model, um, we were following along that, that red trend line. A week later, when we fit the model, we were trending along that green line. And now we're seeing um, increased hospitalizations above and beyond what we estimated with that 59% social distancing level with that green line, meaning that we're seeing an acceleration in the number of hospitalizations that are occurring in the state right now. Next slide. And so if we carry those projections further forward into the Thanksgiving or Christmas winter holiday season, what you'll see here, if you look at the solid lines are if we continue at the same level of social distancing where we have been, so that 50% green line to 55% or 60%, that's sort of the range that we've been in for the last couple of weeks, you'll see that we see a, a substantial increase in the number of cases occurring, um, a peak of illness that occurs early in the winter, and, and what you see with the dotted lines here is, is what we anticipate could happen around Thanksgiving and around the winter holidays if we see decreased levels of social distancing, just as we did with the 4th of July and with Labor Day. We anticipate that is probably going to happen, that we will see decreased levels of social distancing as families gather. We see multi-generational mixing among gatherings. Um, so we, we anticipate that could happen. Of course, we want all of the practices in place to try and minimize differences or decreases in social distancing, but we know that that probably is a likely scenario. And so these projections are, are really showing us that the position that we're going to be in going into those holidays really depends heavily on what level of disease transmission we experience here in the state in the next couple of weeks. Next slide. And so what I want to point out is, is the fact that as we went into the 4th of July surge and the Labor Day surge in disease transmission that we experienced here in the state so far, those two surges really were preceded by very low levels of disease transmission. So if you look at each of these peaks and valleys, you can see that we had a valley or a low level of disease transmission um, that set us up pretty well to to be able to manage that 4th of July surge that we saw. Similarly, um, ahead of the Labor Day surge of disease transmission, we were at a, a low point in disease transmission. Unfortunately, that Labor Day surge was a bit higher than the level of disease transmission that we saw in, in late June, um, but still in a reasonable place um, for us to be able to sufficiently you know, have healthcare resources and public health resources to, to ensure that we could absorb and manage that increase in disease transmission. What we're concerned about going forward is this possible scenario where we don't see a decrease in the level of disease transmission that may occur in the next couple of weeks. So, so really what we need to try and achieve is, is, is suppression of the virus, just as we did following the 4th of July, just as we did following Labor Day, so we can get back down to sort of a valley level of disease transmission, a low level of disease transmission that puts us in a much better place leading into Thanksgiving and into the winter holidays. Next slide. Thank you very much. Turn it back to the governor. So, Dr. Herlihy, and we did this before, we can do it again, right? We saw this after July. There was no shutdown, there were no closures, but people started behaving more responsibly, wearing masks more, avoiding large gatherings. And sure enough, we stopped that trend after early July uh, through July. We can do it again. Uh, I know we can. We just need to do the same. We need to live more like we did in in late july early august we were we were doing it we need to be able to do that again uh and uh together we can we can move forward and set ourselves up for a successful holiday season because we all want to be able to see our loved ones during the holiday season and we want to make sure that the virus is at a place where it's not uh sentencing your loved ones to hospitalization or possible death just by by seeing them so let's let's do what we did in july let's contain this 
Um, another another birthday idea, by the way, another friend of my son's having a 10th birthday, they're going to go, they're having uh, four or five kids going bike riding. So they're going to set up some obstacles. They're going to go to a big park and they're going to be five kids, you know, wearing helmets out there bike riding. So another example of what you can do. Again, you can certainly choose not to have a birthday party for your kid, delay it. That's fine. Uh, but you can also do it in a fun, uh, reasonably safe way. All depends on what uh, risks you want to take. And and uh, but but please don't take a risk for all of us. Uh, meaning doing something that would be dangerous. It could be a super spreader event. That's what it would not just be dangerous to you and your family, but dangerous to the rest of us as well. Testing um, in an effort to boost uh, testing capacity near where people live. Uh, there's been uh, many more sort of neighborhood testing sites. So, for instance. Uh, rather than Pepsi Center, don't go there now. It's no longer there. There's testing in Montbello Recreation Center, Paco Paco Sanchez Park uh, every day this week. Many other Denver testing sites. Uh, Water World remains open, free, quick, easy. You're in and out in 15 minutes uh, in Federal Heights, easy. Uh, we also have uh, testing in Aurora, Restoration Christian Fellowship, 15660 East 6th Avenue. There are over 40 uh, sites across the state. You can check out covid19.colorado.gov slash testing. You can also contact your doctor, go to your community health clinic. Uh, we do advise that if you're experiencing any, any symptoms at all, including symptoms that you might think are caused by the air quality, please get tested. Uh, and if you're not experiencing system, if you're, and if you're not experiencing symptoms, you can still get tested. Uh, if you think you might've been exposed a week before, uh, somebody coughed in a grocery store, a family member or friend has COVID, by all means, go uh, get free, quick and easy testing, covid19.colorado.gov slash testing. I want to also congratulate our state lab. We had we hit our highest day of testing, September 30th, 19,761 tests. Uh, response is really one to two days in most of the testing platforms in the state. You hear about a few that still take three days, but, but most testing you get back in a day or two. Uh, and uh, we look forward to even more ability to do quick testing in the future. Thank you for joining us. Thank you to Dr. Hurley. I cannot emphasize enough the importance of the next few weeks. This will help determine how we get through the next few months uh, until we can successfully administer a vaccine and finally go back to living our lives the way that we uh, love living our lives. But we cannot get complacent. We cannot get fatigued. Sustainable, smart, not a time for tear. Sustainable, smart, not a time for fear, but a time for justified caution. Uh, and together we'll do this. Uh, we should all ask ourselves today over the next few weeks, how can I be better? How can I better do my part to protect myself, my loved ones, my family, my community? Uh, this is really a crucial moment. It's really up to us, up to you, what path our state will take in the weeks and months ahead. With that, we'll open it up to questions. Well, Governor, this is uh, Vinny Delchute. I said Bloomberg News in Denver. I have a two-part COVID question today. Um, how well are Colorado's rural hospitals equipped and staffed to uh, handle an influx of virus patients this fall and winter? And are there any new contingencies or mutual aid plans for rural hospitals since the initial outbreak? Thank you very much, sir. Yeah, and in a moment, I'll turn it over to Dr. Hurley. He'd answer this in more detail. Uh, one of the limiting factors for many of our rural hospitals in the early days was simply personal protection equipment. Uh, we have done a much better job doing that. However, it's important to note that many small hospitals only have a few beds, a very limited capacity. Uh, absolutely, there is the ability to move patients to be able to keep them flexible. I'll turn it over to Dr. Hurley to talk a little bit more about some of the uh, improvements that have been made working with the rural hospitals. Great, thank you, Governor. So, yeah, absolutely. Uh, having a, a network of hospitals across the across the state that can ensure that Coloradans, no matter where they live in the state, have access to the best care is obviously a critical goal for the state. And so, because of that, um, hospitals in rural communities work closely with hospitals in other parts of the state, referral hospitals, to ensure that those rural hospitals have facilities that they can refer patients to, transfer patients to. Um, and we are working local cl closely with our local public health partners too, who assess their hospital capacity, who are looking at metrics on a regular basis to ensure that capacity exists in local communities. And when there are limitations and resources in, in rural communities, ensuring that those referral pathways are available and that patients can get transferred as needed. Hello, Governor. 
I'm Jesús Carrasquel from Noticias Univision. Gobernador, eh, siguen aumento los casos positivos de coronavirus y sobre todo las hospitalizaciones de coronavirus en el estado. ¿Qué medida está tomando para controlarlo y si considera que debería cerrarse el estado nuevamente? Uh, este momento y las semanas próximo son un tiempo importante para, um, para, para ser seguro, para proteger su familia o su propia. Esperam, esperamos que no llegue a ese punto. La orden de quedarse en casa fue muy difícil para familias, las personas, las empresas. Y no queremos regresar a lo, pero es importante salvar vidas también. Es por eso que estamos trabajando en la colaboración con las funcionarias de salud pública locales para asegurarnos de que tengan los recursos necesarios para controlar su parte. Usa máscaras, evitar grandes reuniones y tomar decisiones inteligentes y lavarse sus manos regulares uh, con jabón. Um, son cosas fáciles, pero necesitamos hacerlos para salvar vidas y mejorar nuestra economía. Governor, this is Vicente Arenas with Fox 31. Thank you for taking the question. Today, there are hundreds of people meeting at an Andrew Walmuck Ministers Conference in Woodland Park. This group had another large gathering in July, after which there was a COVID outbreak. They're saying churches are being treated unfairly with capacity regulations. How do you respond to that group saying that it's unconstitutional to restrict capacity for religious gatherings? Thank you for answering the question. Well, look, all, all um, that is important is for people to be responsible, avoid super spreading events, uh, whether those are commercial or faith based or education based, whatever those super spreader events are, the virus doesn't care. I mean, the virus doesn't care whether you're singing hymns or watching a football game or having a barbecue. If you have 50, 100, 300 people in close proximity without masks, you are risking a super spreader event that will cost lives and set our entire state back. Hi, this is Erin Prater with the Denver and Colorado Springs Gazette. Um, any reason that you're doing a virtual presser today? Have you guys had any positive tests within your team? Also, um, do we currently have an, R, uh, an updated R0 value? Um, and can you definitively say that the state would not be shut down again um, if hospitalizations were to surge? Can you definitively say this would be handled county by county or is that a possibility? Thank you. A lot of questions there. Um, we do like to, we do virtual briefings, we do in-person briefings, we'll be doing the in-person and on Friday. Uh, uh, some journalists from different parts of the state prefer both formats. So we continue to do that. Uh, obviously for the in-person briefings, we do them in a safe as way as, as reasonably possible. And uh, if, if you've been to them, you've seen the mask wearing, the social distancing, we will continue that. Uh, we also uh, enjoy being able to make these available virtually using technology. Uh, the uh, we are, the, the plan is to really address capacity regionally. That's why with their CDPHG implemented the dial system to protect our neighbors phase. There are some counties, including Mesa County and six others, uh, that have a low enough virus threshold that they have larger events and they can have their bars open till two and they don't even have to have the mask wearing requirement. Uh, other areas of the state, that's very important because the hospitalizations continue to go up. So it really just depends on each area. Uh, and uh, there is an interplay, obviously, if there's a region that has hospital capacity issues. But uh, I know that Coloradans are doing the right thing. They're being smart. They're being safe. And uh, together we can avoid that kind of uh, issue with our hospitalizations. I, I, there might have been one more question in there. I can't remember. Dr. Hurley, I think, was there one other one? I think a medical one. There was a, a question about the effective reproductive That's number. Right. That's yes. right. Okay. So, so based on the fit of the model last week, we estimate the effective reproductive number is about 1.25 right now. And the important thing to note about that is that is not sustainable. Uh, you can be at 1.25 for, for a few weeks, but it is exponential. Uh, and it is important that you cannot be at that number for months at a time or you overwhelm your hospital. So just like we did in July, we need to have just this gut check and say, okay, we were doing it in late July, we we're doing it in early August. We got to live like we did then, be better, be smarter, avoid large groups better, wear masks around others better, uh, and let's get through this.
Uh, Mr. Governor, Charles Ashby from the Grand Junction Daily Sentinel. Um, you answered a lot of my questions when you talked about the White House and the, and the president, but I'm wondering um, how much you think this has become so political or just too political or just entirely political and in, in fact personally political for you because of the recall effort over your handling of the coronavirus. Um, do you get a sense that what is your frustration level when it comes to that politics and you get a sense that it's going to go away after November 3rd? Is it going to continue to get worse? Um, and how has it made it harder for you to do your job? Yeah, so so separating out the incompetence of the national coronavirus response, which I have talked about in the past, states competing against each other for equipment, the lack of national testing supplies and strategy, uh, Colorado fending on its own to acquire tests overseas. So now moving on from that, just talking about where we are today, um, you know, for those who... For those who uh, uh, follow, um, you know, what's going on in the White House in Washington, D.C., which I think is most Americans, this should be a wake-up call for all of us. It shows that the virus plays no favorites. It can affect any of us at any time. We don't all have the ability to have the same quality of care that the president does when he gets ill. It also shows the importance of having hospital capacity for any of us. The part that's missing is using this as a moment to message safety. So the president shoots from the gut. His gut on not being scared or fearful is the right concept, but then he takes it the wrong direction. He says, don't be fearful, and then insinuates, be careless. He should be messaging, don't be fearful, be cautious and careful, and let's get on with our lives. Um, and, and that's exactly what we're doing. We're at work, we're recreating, we're with our families, we're under safe conditions, visiting our loved ones, we're doing these things, but we're not doing them the same way we did a year ago because the social environment that existed a year ago leads to exponential growth in the virus. Tens of thousands of Coloradans would lose their lives if we lived in that way. But we have to live. We have to enjoy life. We have to see loved ones. We, so for some of us, that means birthday parties. For some of us, that means Halloween. For some, it means church. For all of us, it means going to work. Um, and we're going to figure out how to do that safely, and we are. Mask wearing avoiding distant, avoiding uh, groups, outdoor meetings where possible, being smart, being cautious, being safe, uh, and moving forward. Hi, Governor Polis, it's Jessica Seaman with the Denver Post. Um, I was wondering if you could give us a better idea of how you are implementing the dial framework and when the state will move counties up to a higher level. Yeah, well, that really determined the plans on the, the data. It's, dri it's driven entirely by the data in three areas. Um, uh, it's driven by case count, it's driven by positivity rate, and it's driven by hospitalization rate. So with that process, we hope that each county has the tools to continue to move forward in reducing the risk. There have been setbacks like they've seen in Boulder County, predominantly, primarily driven by the city of Boulder. Uh, Boulder County Health, the city, worked with the university to get that under control. Early indications are that from that uh, 18 to 20 year old, two year old demographic, the infection rate has significantly decreased since those mitigation me measures. So the goal is to do targeted local interventions to prevent outbreaks, site based containment, avoiding community wide, county wide, or God forbid, statewide outbreaks. There are no more, no more questions. Thank you all for joining us. Be safe. You know, uh, I will give you know credit. The, the president was right about not being fearful. We can't be fearful. But the second part of that is be careful. Be careful. I care about you. Your loved ones care about you. You are an important part of Colorado for all. Let's stay healthy. Let's move forward in the weeks and months ahead. We did it before in July and we bent the curve. We can do it again. Uh, and let's prepare ourselves for a successful, fun, and fulfilling holiday season. Thank you.